when you want to start, Alex? Uh, let's go. Let's go. Go live. All we right. Uh, we. Are we live? We are live, my friend. We are live. Okay. Good evening and welcome to Power BI User Group Manchester for June. Uh, good evening to the 30 or so attendees that have come alive, um, have come up, come live, <laughs> who've joined us this evening. Uh, we're in for a treat because we've got two fantastic speakers. First of all, we've got Alexander Arvidsson, uh, all the way from Sweden, who will be joining us to talk through inventing Power BI step by step. And once we've sorted out Benny's little technical issues, we'll be having Benny De Jager joining us from Holland over around about seven o'clock. So intro, so we've got uh, Alexander Arvidsson uh, with Building an Empire in Power BI. Uh, then we've got Benny Diego, troubleshooting Power BI report performance at seven o'clock. Uh, for those of you new to the Power BI user group, uh, we've been going for around about three and a half, almost four years. Uh, we get we do the sessions face to face in Manchester when we can, uh, and we try to get around, we normally get around 80 to 100 people. Uh, I'm guessing by, um, the fact that we don't have pizza and beer, we've lost a few attendees to these webinars, but the sessions are fantastic, they're engaging, uh, and uh, we've got some good re um, reviews. Uh, so welcome to the Power BI Group if you're a newbie. Uh, hopefully before the end of the year, we'll be able to have a face-to-face -face session. Um, in terms of tonight, obviously we've got two fantastic speakers, uh, and I look forward to, first of all, introducing Benny shortly. Uh, but those of you who have not met myself, I'm an experienced data recruiter, been doing it for 15 years. Uh, I work in the BI and data space uh, and I've been running various different events. So if you are looking for a new job or you've seen some of my jobs are posted today, please do get in touch. Uh, my email address is alex.taylor.robwalters.com and my mobile number is on there. Uh, and if you're a hiring manager and you're looking to expand your team, please do not hesitate to get in touch with me. I'll be able to give you mark information and sample CVs at very short notice. Um, and before we go, I'm just, before I go and talk through our, our Power BI Lunch and Learn session, we've got our session next uh, Wednesday. So if Ben can just flick through to that slide now, it's the last one. There we go. Yeah, we're, we're on the World Tour episode four. I'm sure some of you have already joined us for the first three episodes of season two. Uh, we've got Greg Deckler. Uh, who we're talking through, uh, he's a VP Cloud Services at um, in Ohio for Fusion Alliance, and he'll be talking through disconnected table tricks. Uh, so this, this is the only man in the, in the planet to earn three and five thousand kudos on the Microsoft Power BI community. Uh, I'm not far behind him. But without further ado, I will pass you over now to Alexander Arvison, uh, who's the uh, principal architect at Atia in Lindkop, Sweden. Uh, pleasure joining us tonight, Alexander. Can you hear me, Alexander? Yes, I can. Hi, Alexander. You well? Yes, I am. Well, it's it's 32 degrees where I'm standing. <laughs> but it is what it is. I mean, so I, I've, I've done training this entire week. Um, so I, I do a lot of training and, and I prefer to do it face-to-face, uh, uh, -face, but well, the world ended. So I'm stuck here in my room. So it's 32 degrees. And the question you need to ask yourself is, am I wearing pants? <laughs> <laughs> Are you? You're not a DBA. <laughs> Never know. Well, right, just to, I'll up. let you go now, Alexander. Good luck with your speak, your talk, and we'll be passing three questions to you around about seven o'clock to answer. Superb. Let's Thank go. You. So I'm just waiting for them to switch over to my my video. Oh, there we go. I should be I should be alive. I'm well, live. I, yes, you're live. I, I like to be live because that is much more boring. So welcome to building an empire, implementing Power BI step by step. So switch over here. As most stories do, this one started with a phone call. I was asked to come out to a customer and that had jumped in both feet first into Power BI. They had embraced the uh, whole self-service approach, i.e. anything goes, and now they wanted to discuss the uh, state of the project. I thought I detected an undertone of, of desperation, but uh, yeah, I, I prepared for the worst. It wasn't enough. So here's the thing. I used to be a paramedic, and the first thing you do when you come at an accident scene is what's called triage. So this is to quickly get a grasp of the work ahead and start to 
prioritize patients. And that was pretty much what I had to do in this case because the issues were legion. Their data sources were slow. Reports were absolutely hammering the data sources. The data quality was absolute and complete crap. The security was nowhere to be found. A lot of work was endlessly repeated and no one was certifying any data at all. So something needed to be done, stat, because this patient was pretty rapidly expiring. So how do you build an empire? You build an empire on control. You build an empire on order. You build an empire on structure. But you also build an empire on efficiency, on empowerment and simplicity. What I saw coming into my customer was none of that. I was, it was like the, the ugly aftermath of rampant self-service BI, where control was nowhere to be found, structure was unheard of, and uh, empowerment meant that anybody could do exactly what they wanted. That's not an empire, that's chaos. Today, we'll go through using Power BI to empower your users to achieve more without chaos. We're gonna look at the why, how, and the, the why, what, and how of Power BI data flows and data sets. We're gonna see if we can figure out a few tips on the way. Because I think you might recognize some of the issues that my customer faced. You might even face some of them right now. My goal is to give you food for thought on how you might take back control and increase order, efficiency, and empowerment. So my name is Alexander. Uh, my pronouns are he and him. I come from Sweden. I thus don't have your garden variety British accent. I have more of an American accent. I've been at this thing for 20 odd years. I started working with databases back in 1997, and then it's just been downhill from there. So I came in from the database side. I, I, I started as a DBA, and then I started uh, looking at the BI side of things. So it's very interesting to come from that side of thing and not come from Excel, Power BI, and then into data. It's, it's another perspective. I am one of six data platform MVPs in Sweden, the only one that does both SQL Server and, and Power BI. I'm a certified trainer. I run all over the world speaking at a lot of conferences. I, I did um, Ignite, for instance, but then the world ended and I've been pretty much stuck in, in my office since then. I work for a company in Sweden called Atea, where you're a systems integrator, and I run, uh, together with two of my friends, a, a um, fairly successful podcast called Knee Deep in Tech. So, how the heck did we get here? Let's backtrack a bit to, to get some common ground to stand on because we were, we were basically wading chest high in, in muck. So what if we, um, let, let's pretend we're the San Francisco PD. We want a dashboard that shows the crime rate per uh, police district. So what we want to be able to do is we want to click around and, and see how things change. And I mean, this is just your normal uh, interactive kind of report. There's nothing strange here. The only strange thing with this data set though is why on earth the southern police district is north of the northern police district? But I don't think that's the fault of Power BI. I think that's the fault of San Francisco. It's a beautiful city, but I still don't get it. So here we have our dashboard. How do we get here? What do we need to have to get to this dashboard? Well, we need to start with a data source. And in this case, the data source is gonna be a CSV file or a comma separated values text file, just for, for ease of, of, of um, visualizing in your head. We have the data, but we can't just present it because we need to do something to get there. We need, for instance, to do what's known as data wrangling because the data is not just plug and play. Some data needs to be tweaked. Some data types need to change. Uh, some data should be removed as it's not relevant to the analysis that we're doing. And this is done through Power Query. And this is generally the domain of what's known as the data engineer. When we have that, then it start, it's time to do something with it. Because when the data is in a format that we can make sense of, it's time to put it in the hands of those who know the data best, the business. 
and armed with a good data set. It's up to them to create a nice visual supporting the analytical efforts that we just saw. And this is kind of tricky because this generally requires several, several competencies. The primary two being visual communication and the ability to write data analysis expressions or DAX. Anybody who says that DAX is easy, smack them over the head. It isn't. It's not. It, it's, it's simple. It's deceptively simple, but it's not easy. OK, so. When we refresh the data, we want to see the new data. What's going to happen is I'm, I'm going to click refresh in in Power BI. So the data is going to be. Grabbed from the data source and then it's being pushed through the pipeline from the data source over there through the data wrangling and we're back into um, to um, the, um, the Power BI desktop in this case. OK, so how does that look? What does it look like? How do, how do you do that? Well, let's take a peek at how you actually do this, because this is Power BI desktop and the query editor. So let's add some weather data. We're going to go import a new data source, and that's going to be San Francisco weather. And there are some things that we need to do to this data set. For starters, we need to choose what columns we want to use, and there are a lot of them that we don't care about. We don't care about precipitation attributes and so on and so forth, and we actually don't care about the T average or the average temperature because it's it's null. Having done that, it's time to change up things so we make it easier to read. We're going to change the data type for precipitation. Unfortunately, this is designed for the US format, so I need to tell it that we're actually going to be using um, that this actually is US format. Otherwise, it would not have been possible to change it to a number. And I changed the name as well. Having done that, we can add a custom column because sure, Imperial is fine, but I want to have stuff in millimeters as well. And what we do is we multiply the inches by 25.4 to get inches to millimeter. And boom, we had another column. We need to change that one to a decimal number as well, so we can do some math on it later. OK, what about the T max? The T max is going to be in Fahrenheit as well. And the T min, the minimum temperature, it's going to be in Fahrenheit. With those, I think we need an average as well. So let's put in a T average, and that's going to be in Fahrenheit. And it's simply the max plus the min divided by two. Not that tricky. But what is tricky is when we want to go from, from um, Fahrenheit to Celsius. I can never remember how to do that, but we're going to put in a custom column. And as a good TV chef, I've already put that in the, the, um, the, the, the clipboard. And again, we need to change this to the right type. There we go with the decimal number. And all that's left is calling the data set something. In this case, we're going to go for weather data as of 2016. OK. So now we've done all the steps that we need to use this data. We, we've tweaked it. We've, to, to use the, the words of uh, Patrick, um, in, a guy in the queue, we've, we've massaged the data. He likes to massage the data. And yeah, he does. So what if we take this data and we add it to the report? Well, where would we put it? Mm, let's put it over the lower right visual because it's it's always already prepared as a, a combo chart. So I'm taking my average temperature because I want to see if my average temperature is going to have any impact on the crime rate. Whoops. OK, that didn't quite work as I have planned. Oh yeah, we need to change that to a line and stacked one because otherwise it's going to be weird. So we've just moved the number of crimes to the line values. That way it's going to look good. But why on earth are hmm, we're we'll, we'll going to come back to why are the the um, the columns are the same? We're going to say sum, and this is the average temperature. But still, why are the columns the same? Well, we're missing something. And in order to fix that, we need to go to the relationship view because we don't have a relationship between the date 
uh, of the weather and the date table. We don't know the correlation because we don't have a connection. That's easily fixed. We just take the date and we drag the date. I have a date table here. I'm going to come back to that in a bit. And well, ha, huh, there we go. Suddenly we have that information. We we might tweak the the name of this visual just a tad as well. So there we have the number of crimes per month and average temperature. So that's how we added this data. So far we haven't done anything exotic, anything strange even. But what we have done is we now have a report based on no fewer than two data sources. And what happens if I actually refresh this? Well, we're going to go out and pull the data from the data sources, all of them, and push it into Power BI uh, Power Query, and then we're going to have the wrangled result into Power BI. Well, that's all fair, but the issue that we're starting to face here as we keep working on this, because there turned out to be a lot of people that wanted access to this data set. So we did a few copies, or my customer did a few copies, and suddenly we now have six data sources. Where it's, it's all based off the same Excel files, same CSV files, but we have a lot of copies of them and a lot of copies of the Power BI desktops. So when we push refresh, what do you think is gonna happen? Yeah, it's going to go out and grab all of these Excel sheets, CSV files. It's, it's going to be an, an unholy mess in no time flat. Wouldn't it be better if we could kind of take all the wrangling steps, the Power Query steps that we have, and put that in a reusable thing? Funny you should say that, because there's something called data flows. All right, so what are data flows? Well, first of all, I really need to have a word with someone at Microsoft Marketing because we have data flows in Power BI. We also have data flows in Azure Data Factory. They are not the same. That's an aside. So how, how do you do this? Well, what if I told you there's, there's a way to reuse all that Power Query magic? Exactly. Say hello to Power BI data flows. So what we're going to do is we're going to reuse data sources with data flows. And we have everything that we just did, like you see over there. We take that and we put it in a Power BI data flow, which happens to be stored as a data lake. But don't, don't worry about that just now. With that, we can now connect a Power BI re report to our Power BI data flow as if it was just another data source. So I kind of packaged the data source and the Power Query Wrangling as a new data source. Hello, well, that's kind of useful because what you can do from this point forward is this. You can now have multiple reports based off the same data flow. And what's also kind of neat with this, which kind, it, it can be either very, very good or very, very, oops, it works like this. Because if I do a refresh of my report here, what do you think is going to happen? Well, it's going to go to the data lake and refresh and pull in the data. So that means that we just opened up a bit of a can of worms because if I do refresh on all of my reports, they're all going to go to the data lake. But wait a second, is it never going to go back to the data source? So what we just did was introduce another layer of uh, caching, basically. So when we refresh the data lake or the, the data flow, that's when we pull in the data from the data source. Until we do that, Every refresh in Power BI is just going to hit the lake and pull that data. So suddenly we just removed all pressure from the sources, but we're also removing uh, the refreshing of the actual data. So it, it comes with, um, you, you need to figure this out before you start working with it. 
So what do we what do we gain from this? Well, it's it's pretty obvious. We're going to reduce the risk of deviating data because instead of having five people doing massaging on the same data and hopefully getting the same result, you can have one person doing massaging on the data and sharing the result. And that also increases performance because we are no longer hitting the data sources like crazy. It's not going to be a battalion of people wanting to get access to the data because it's stored in the data lake. And what's also super, super nice is that it's much easier to find your data sources because you can actually flag these data sources as um, certified and, and promoted. And now it is suddenly much easier to make sure that people use a curated and well um, thought out data set or, or data source, data flow, I should say. Now, the funny thing is you're gonna, you're gonna get a fourth one. And the fourth one is that we have something called incremental refresh, which is where instead of pulling all the data from the data source into the data flow and then presenting it up to the data, uh, to the, the Power BI desktop or uh, Power BI um, portal, we can grab just the changed data. That means though that we are putting our fingers into the premium territory. More about that in a bit. So if we keep diving into these data flows, how do you do them? I keep yammering about that it's it's Power Query. It's it's the same thing. Well, it is actually. It's it's almost entirely the same thing. And if someone could explain to me why my headset decides once a day to reboot, I'd be a happy camper. It it has done so without fail since I got it. And I, I just had a, a 10 second reboot, but I'm back. So how do you do this? Let's see. So you go in here. You are now, or we are now in the, the portal. Because in the portal, we can create something called the data flow. The data flow is something that you only find in the portal simply because of the data being stored in a data lake. You can attach a Power BI desktop report to a data flow. That works fine, but the data flow in itself lives in the cloud. And that's the reason why you cannot have data flows with the Power BI report server to um, too much chagrin. So. How do you do this? Well, you have a lot of data sources, right? But we can look at the, the Power Query that we did. This is Power Query. It, it looks scary, but it's not that difficult to read, really. Because what we have at the top, and that's the, the, the um, thing that I want, to, want you to look at, it says source, csv.document file, and then I have a, a path. So. I have my data on my machine. Hmm. How do I get access to my machine from Power BI or the Power BI service? There must be a way, and there is a way. Okay, so don't worry about all the transformations. This is just the te uh, text, uh, textual, um, the text for what we did in the graphical user interface just a few minutes ago. So what we have is we have the source data from our Excel files or CSV files or whatever they may be. And then we pull this to the service through something called the Power BI Gateway. And the Power BI Gateway is a piece of code or it's a service that sits on a server somewhere. And that is going to in, um, initialize a push of data up to the cloud. So the gateway is what Power BI data flows will use to access my on-prem um, Excel files. Easy, because otherwise it would not work. Now, there is a potentially smarter way to do this, because in rare cases, people don't want to have the Power BI gateway. I've heard all kinds of, of explanations why they don't like it. It's 
ugly, it's dirty, and it's insecure. I don't buy it. It's it's nothing insecure with this this power gateway, but let's just say that someone doesn't want it for some reason. All right. But say they are running Office 365. Then there is no point in running the Power BI Gateway because you can do it in another way. So what you can do, again, we have the source data. What if we put the source data already in the cloud? And we can do that by using OneDrive because anything that I put into OneDrive will be synced to the cloud. And well, Power BI, OneDrive, it's the same cloud. They kind of talk to each other already. So all I need to do is to change the connector in Power BI, Power BI, the, the Power, BI, um, um, Power BI data flows to talk to something called the Web API connector. Because what is OneDrive? OneDrive is SharePoint. It is a somewhat tweaked SharePoint underneath. So almost every way of accessing a SharePoint site works fine with a OneDrive uh, file. You need to, to trick, fix around a bit to, to get the URL, but once you get the hang of it, it's that easy. I'm going to show you this in the demo in a second. So what we have now is Power BI data flows, talking to the Power BI, the Web API connector, which in turn is pointing to a file in SharePoint or OneDrive, depending on the way you're looking at it, which in turn grabs the data from the source. I'm blown. How do, how, how do I do this? I'm very happy you asked. So we're back to the portal and let's see how we actually create a data flow from start to finish. And we're going to do this the lazy way because we've already done all the heavy lifting. There is no point in redoing all the steps. We already have them. We did that in Power BI Desktop. We already did all the funky steps in order to get the data into a shape we wanted to. So let's reuse that. But we're going to go up and create a data flow. There we go. I'm going to go with defining new entities. We're not going to touch on the other ones. And here we have the different data sources. And I need to go down a bit to go for the web API. There we go. And then I put in the URL and I just paste it because this one is pointing to my OneDrive, the whole URL thingy. I need to log in. I already did that. So that's why I can go next um, immediately. It does some thinking and suddenly you see the data exactly as the raw format. So I go up to the advanced editor and then I take all this away apart from the source because the only difference is the source all the other steps are identical and boom bob's your uncle here we go and suddenly we reused the power query that we did in power bi desktop i can now save and close it's going to validate and now it's going to ask me do you want to refresh Saving the data flow, I'm giving it a name. This is going to be weather data as of 2016. And now, do you want to refresh? If I don't refresh, we're not going to be pulling any data from the data sources into the, um, the data lake. So it's going to be, um, th there's not going to be any data. And that's probably not what we want. So we want to do both a refresh now and then we want to set a refresh schedule to periodically refresh, but then we'll be refreshing on our terms and not when the data source is unexpectedly being hit very heavily. So let's let's backtrack a bit and see what we actually just did because it is a bit scary with, with Power Query. I know that. So this is the, the original Power Query stuff. And what we have here is the source. And I just need to change that source, as you can see here. So instead of having, instead of having the the um, CSV dot document and pointing to my own um, my, my own um, PC, now I'm going to SharePoint. 
arcticdba-my.sharepoint.com slash personal blah 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 and all the way down to weather.csv. It's the same file, I just put it into OneDrive and this is how I can access the OneDrive from Power BI without any trace of the Power BI um, um, gateway. Kind of neat and I'm lazy. As Patrick says, I'm not lazy, I'm efficient and I would have to agree. So what did we do? Well, we need to keep in mind that we must refresh the data lake. And I keep talking about this data lake. What data lake? Well, so the thing is you can choose to put things in your own data lake or you can choose to just use the data lake that you get handed automatically. And a data lake for the purposes of this presentation is just an infinite storage area. It's a, it's a lake, it's, it's a bottomless lake of data where you can store things. And what's gonna happen is when you create your Power BI data flow, you're gonna have the Power Query, i.e. The, the steps to do something with the data, and you're gonna have the data itself being pulled in from the, um, the different data sources and dumped into the lake. Kind of neat. And this also means that whenever I do a refresh of my data lake, which I do on a, a um, schedule basis, well, it's gonna go out, pull the data from the data sources, push everything through the Power Query, and there we go. Mind blown. This is super, super, super useful. I'm gonna show you a few examples more. There is a few things that we need to think about though. There are two things. We have the computed entities and we have the linked entities. If you see these, we are now in premium territory. And people think that premium is, is expensive. And it's kind of hard to argue with like 4,000 pounds a month that it, it's hard to argue that it's not expensive. It's a lot of money. But is it expensive though? Well, that's, that's much more difficult to say because you get all these amazing uh, things through premium that you do not get from the pro stuff. So is it expensive? Is it cheap? Well, it depends on what you want and what you need. But what you can get with these computed entities and linked entities, that's pretty much when you uh, link to tables in, uh, in Power BI uh, Power Query, that's these guys. And you also get an enhanced compute engine that can do uh, joining and that kind of stuff. So it does not impact your sources in the same way. So maybe you can get away without these. I know for a fact that a lot of, um, of my customers, they don't need premium to do what they want to. Some things you might need to tweak a bit, but you can get away with a lot without going premium. There is also a lot of really, really good sessions and blog posts on uh, how to get access to premium without paying for a P1 SKU. You can whip up an A1 or an, an A4 SKU uh, and then turn it off if you don't need it anymore. Um, Mark Lelliveld has a very, very good session on this and he has uh, a few um, uh, blog posts as well. So what do we get out of Power BI data flows? Well, it's, it's almost the same thing as Power Query. We are gonna find some situations where we can't just copy and paste the Power Query text. We might run into some issues. Uh, they, they used to be more issues than there are now. I, I vividly remember when uh, data flows came out and I started testing this, I broke it pretty much every other day. It's, it's much, much better. Th this is really, really useful. Keep in mind though that some features really do require premium. Be aware of that. Look at what those features are and do some mental math. Do I need this or can I, can I get around this in some way? And you also need to consider the refresh because otherwise you're not going to have any data in your data lake and that is going to suck because you're not going to have any data, period. So what happens when we go beyond data flows? Well, 
we have now solved the issue with people running rampant with Power Query. But that's only half of the issue, really, when it comes to reuse. Because you remember this. What happened was when I, I first put in the weather data was that I didn't have any connection to my date table. What the heck is a date table anyways? So I needed something to make that turn into this, and that was the connection in the data model. And the connection in the data model, well, here we have the data model. I have the police department crime data. I have a date table and I have a day and night table. Why, why do I have a date table and a day and night table? Well, it works like this. In the police department data, as well as the weather data, you're going to find dates. And the date's going to be a specific date. So that means that I can look in the data for the, the, the crime data and see exactly what happened on April the 2nd. But I know that April the 2nd is part of the month April. So I can take, out, take all the rows for April and do something about it. But what if I told Power BI that April is indeed a month, a specific month, or it's going to be part of a specific week and so on and so forth. So what I'm doing with the date table, and that's a pretty small date table, is that I'm, I'm adding metadata to the dates and suddenly I can slice things on weeks. I can slice things on the month in a way that I cannot do before I have a date table. Even more interesting is time because I, I probably want to integrate over time. I want to see what happens over a, a time period. I'm going to do some average um, crimes over a time period. How do I do that if I just have a specific time down to the second? Well, I introduce a, a timetable. That's exactly what we have over there. So what I'm doing is I'm grouping times into 15 minute slots and suddenly I can do some funky math and average and stuff like that over time chunks. And in this case, it's going to be 15, 30 or 45 minute chunks. So that's how I add instant value to my data without touching the actual data. But in order to work with this, I need to add a connection. I need to have my weather data connected to the date table. So we are all in agreement what date we're looking at at all. And suddenly everybody is in agreement. Okay, so why am I going on about this? Well, this is not part of the data flow. This is the data model and the data model is something else completely. We can keep going with this and I'm going to show you one more thing and that is the, the main logic behind the entire report that I showed you is just one measure, the number of crimes. It's just a count. It looks like this. That's the, the thing that does all those visuals you saw, just one um, measure. And you never have just one measure. You're probably going to have a lot of measures. And since this is DAX, and not everybody is very comfortable with DAX, well, you can find yourself in the same position that you did with Power Query. People are, are basing their reports off the same data, but they need to create the date table and they need to connect the data model and they need to do this. And that opens up a can of worms again. What if, what if we could just do the Power Query stuff to a data flow and then we connect the data flow to a data model and then we connect reports to an already cooked and prepared data set? How awesome wouldn't that be? Like, like this. There's a way to do that. There is an amazing way to do that. So suddenly we can have three visuals, three reports that are based off the same data set as we see over there. So we now introduce a new word and that is data set. And it looks like this when we actually start to combine the whole thing. So all the way over there, we have the, the source data, right? 
the source data gets pushed through the Power Query, the data wrangling side of things. And we dump the whole thing into the data lake. Then we build a data set on top of the data flow because the data set adds stuff like measures and the data model and gives all the things fuzzy and, and nice names, makes it easy to work with. And then we hand it over to our team, um, report makers, the visual specialists, the communicators, the business e experts. They don't need to know about all the itty bitty details that go into all the measures. I'm sure we're gonna have some power users that, that want to know that, and that's fine, but the vast majority don't need and shouldn't need uh, that kind of information. What's even more useful here is that we can do endorsements, and we can do endorsements both on the Power BI data flows and the data sets these days. When I, I first presented this session, I could only do it on on um, data sets, but now I can do it on data flows as well. So we can say that this data set or data flow is promoted or certified. And a word of warning, what do you think that uh, certified means? It doesn't mean squat. Certified only means that some admin has decided that some person has the rubber stamp of certified. Boom. And we need to trust that person to specify that this data set or data flow is certified. But there's no, there's no magic in it. You just need to set up a business process to certify a data set or a data flow. But it is super useful because these will appear on top of every other data set or data flow. So you really find that one very, very quickly when it's time to start doing your, your report work. Why are we doing this? Well, because when you start doing things on a slightly larger scale, what always happens is that you, you um, introduce a new piece of software and you're gonna have the generalists come in. But as, as you move forward and you do more and more with Power BI and you have more and more users and more and more people, well, suddenly you're gonna start to, to um, differentiate because you're gonna have people that does Power Query. I'm so, so with Power Query, I'm, I'm okay. I mean, I, I come from the integration side of things on databases, so Power Query is, is, is fairly simple for me. I really don't do DAX very well. Um, I'm, I'm fine with, with creating a data model, but, but writing DAX and listening to, to people like Marco Russo and Alberto Ferrari, I get a splitting headache because this one is difficult for me. I, I, I have a hard time wrapping my head around it. So I, I don't wanna do this. I'm sure there are so many more people that are amazing at this. I'm not one of them. I'm fairly good at doing the report thing, but what you're seeing here is separation of duties. You can create an environment where someone who's very, very good at data wrangling, they're, they're gonna do the power query stuff. Someone who's an expert at DAX, maybe coming in from, from Excel, they're gonna do that thing. And then you have these specialists in reporting, in views, in visual communication to do this because none of these things are easy. And why should you have to do all the things? I might be an expert at doing reports. I might suck at the other things. That's why we have more people, and that's why we have a separation of duties. And as we move forward, we, um, we have a few tweaks and things and ideas that I wanna share with you. I told you that we have a data lake. Yep, so what is inside of this data lake is a standardized format known as the common data model. And this is really underneath the, the covers, just CSV files. So it pulls in the data, it does the Power Query magic, and then it stores it as CSV files. And what you can do is attach your own data lake. Maybe you already have a ton of data in a data lake, an organizational data lake. You can attach this to Power BI. 
And that's going to give you two things. One is the opportunity to read the Power Query data flows from the data lake and use in a third party uh, tool. You might want to pull it into something else. You might want to pull it into, um, oh, I don't know, uh, Power Flows or Word or, God forbid, Tableau. Something else that can talk to the data lake. That is one way of looking at things. But since the structure of a data flow is well defined, again, it's it's the common data model, you can do it the other way. You can create a data flow by hand, if you will, or, or using some other tool and store it inside of the data lake without ever having to go through the Power Query steps. So it gives you added flexibility and really a good reuse of your already existing data. Word of warning though, at this moment, you can attach your data lake storage, your organizational data lake to Power BI. You cannot detach it. So it's a one-way street right now. They're working on it, but it's it's not there yet. So don't go out and try this because you're gonna go, oh dear, and that kind of sucks. So my goal here was to give you some idea of the workspaces, uh, of, of what we can do. And the next step would be to, uh, to put data flows in workspaces. What do I mean with data flows in workspaces? Well, we have the different app workspaces. Again, I want to have a discussion with someone at Microsoft uh, Marketing that decided to call this app. Everybody and their cat has at least an app these days, and I'm getting old. I digress. So with the workspaces, we have app workspaces for specific applications, and, and um, so the combination of, of a, a report, of a, maybe a dashboard, a data set, and that kind of stuff, that gets wrapped up into an app. But what you can also do is put your data flows in a workspace, a workspace that nobody has access to. People can still read the data flow and use the data flow, but nobody that shouldn't be able to do so can edit the data flow. So that's a good way of, of separating so people don't need to worry about what this data flow thing is. Again, it's a kind of separation of duties, if you will. I would also, very much urge you to implement a data catalog because the the only difference between a data lake and a data swamp is if you have a clue what you put into the data lake and when you put it in and what is that horrible smell yes that's what your data lake is going to smell like it, it's going to be horrible if you don't know what you have and it doesn't matter if you have a petabyte of data if you don't know where it is or what it is a data catalog is something as simple as a tool that says, oh, you want to have information about finance. OK, you need to go to this directory in the lake. It's formatted in this way. It is um, broken out by month, by week, by day, and by hour. And this is the format. All that metadata stuff is what you get from the data catalog. There is a tool in Azure there was the data catalog version one. It is so horrible that we don't talk about that one ever. There is a version two that definitely shows promise. And what you want a data catalog to be able to do is to go in and kind of crawl your data to figure out what things look like. And well, you know, do some um, automatic um, metadata for you. In all this, everything I've shown you is absolutely and utterly useless unless you can get people on board. IT does not have any reason for being on its own. IT always is there for supporting business. I mean, I've, I've been an IT guy for 20, close to 25 years. I think that is the right call. I love data, I love tech, I love toys, but at the end of the day, it's all about the business and business is all about people. And if you can't get people on board and establish a pure data culture, everything else is moot. Because only by getting a data culture and getting people to think about the data, think about stuff like quality, 
uh, think about why they have things, why this data, what about this data, how does it work? Until then, they are just users that don't care. So if you can, or when you can, start to look into establishing a data culture. Now, that's a session all of its own. I can talk for days about data culture, uh, but I would highly recommend you to look at the blog of Matthew Roche, one of the, um, the people on the, the CAT team, uh, ssbipolar.com. It's an amazing blog and he speaks a lot about data culture stuff. So my goal was to give you food for thought. How do you might take back control and increase order efficiency and empowerment? And what can we conclude? Well, we can conclude that order is absolutely necessary. Ordnung muss sein, as they say in Germany. It, it, it just needs to happen because otherwise you have chaos and chaos is not conducive to business. Google might disagree, but yeah, that's my, my point. And reuse will increase efficiency because why keep finding new ways to mess up? People say finding new ways to reinvent the wheel, but yeah, most of the time we're just gonna mess up. So reuse your code. Do the hard work once and then reap the benefits multiple times. And how do we do this? Well, again, it's all about the people. So empower your people. Make sure that they have the, the necessary tools, the necessary skills, and the necessary privileges. Because if you have a good data culture, if you have a good people culture, people are going to go and say, hmm, that's interesting. Could you help me? Or, or they're going to try on their own and work forward. So empowering is going to ensure collaboration. It doesn't sound very strange when I'm saying it, but it is what it is. A lot of companies tend to, to really push down on the privileges, but empower people. You will be a happier camper for it. So what can we, can we conclude? Well, stop trying to eat the whole elephant in one go because it doesn't work and it will inevitably lead to some serious indigestion. You need to break down the whole implementing Power BI as a step by step process. You need to do it in a uh, circular fashion. Small steps keep going and increase. So instead of trying to just eat the whole thing, use the tools, use the people to work smarter, enlist the business to have a speaking partner and make sure that you always have a very, very clear, why are we doing this as your guiding star? With that, let's go build an empire with Power BI. I thank you so much for your time. My name is Alexander and here are my uh, contact information if you want to reach out. I think it's easier to go to uh, Twitter, uh, but you're, you're more than welcome to uh, send me an email as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alexander. Uh, we really enjoyed your presentation this evening. Uh, it was really, really good. Um, you're probably not aware, but we, um, we've been able to, unable to get hold of Benny uh, to get him involved tonight. So we've managed to rearrange him for two weeks' time. So, oh. so we had issues with teams getting logged on. So yep. I, I, I have told the, uh, the rest of the attendees that unfortunately Benny won't be um, taking part tonight. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so in terms of um, tonight, we're, we're going to wrap up early. Um, and we, 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 we've really enjoyed your talk. It was really, really good. There's not been many questions, so I've, I've been waiting by the Q&A for anyone to ask questions, but I think you've, you've given such a detailed and fantastic talk that everyone's been really happy with what, what you said. I'm sure if they want to get in touch with you, they can connect with you on LinkedIn. Um, I'm sure that um, the guys will, will probably watch back the, the, the talk on, on, on demand, the ones the guys haven't seen it tonight. But um, I just want to say thank you from myself and the rest of the guys at the Use Group for taking time to present this evening. Uh, very impressed by green screen, by the way. Uh, I think some of the trainers that I, I work with have been watching tonight and are, are thinking about investing in one of those green screens. It's, it's very professional. So the, um, the, the green screen really, really works. And What's even more fun is it looks like now I'm I'm standing in my my um, my home office. Yeah. But what it is, 
it's a picture of my home office. So, <laughs> yeah. There you go. Green screens are fun. But yeah, but as well as well for, 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 from from everyone to say thank you very much for for, for this evening. Um, uh, if there's any other content you want to share with us, please do. Uh, it's been a really, really fantastic um, session tonight. Um, we will be back in two weeks with Benny. Uh, Benny will be giving us a talk on his troubleshooting Power BI reporting. Uh, and next Wednesday, we have Power BI Lunch and Learn episode four. So thank you very much for everyone's attendance this evening. Get out back outside, enjoy the sunshine, enjoy the football that's back on. Uh, and I will see you in two weeks uh, for Power BI user group. Uh, June part two with Benny, or I'll see you next Wednesday for the Power BI Lunch and Learn session with Sheb, Lewis and Ben. Take care and enjoy your evening. Thank you. Awesome. Take care. Cheers, guys. Bye. Cheers.